Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Florian Klemus, a graduate student who will be defending his thesis on Monday. Uh, so this is kind of a practice one for him. He's at the University of Bern and is going to be talking about non-spherical atom refinement in OLEX2. Florian? Hello. Uh, it's really nice that you have me here. Thank you for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to present uh, our latest features of uh, OLEX2 and NOSFERATU in OLEX2. So NOSFERATU is the abbreviation of non-spherical atoms uh, in OLEX2. And it is available um, starting with OLEX2 1.3 in the latest version. If you still use a version of 1.2, um, please go to the Olexis website and download a newer version because uh, Nosferatu is only implemented in the newest up-to-date version. If you don't see it, it is very likely that you do not have the correct version of Olex2 installed. Um, Nosferatu basically um, aims at an improvement to the crystallographic model that we uh, use in our everyday uh, refinement techniques. That is, um, we usually um, are worried about the intensities that we measure and how to model them using our um, structure factors. And the structure factors are basically a calculation of atomic contributions uh, going over all atoms J um, that is consisted in this way. We have an atomic form factor um, and the positions of the atoms and the thermal motion. And in the normal refinement that you do, for example, if you used OLEX2 so far, um, you use the um, refinement of atomic positions and the ADPs that um, are optimized in a way to, to achieve best agreement between the measured intensities and your model form factors. However, um, going a bit more into detail, we can also look at the atomic form factor itself, which does not necessarily need to be the one that is um, until now mo most widely used. So if we um, look at the, the model that is mostly used today, for example, if you use Shell X or if you use Olex to refine, it is the independent atom model. The independent, the independent atom model refers to atoms that are spheres that are simply superimposed. So each, each of these carbon atoms is a sphere and we have an isosurface here of the electron density levels. And as you can see, at some point, the link between the two carbon atoms is uh, disturbed and broken. While if we use, for example, Hirschfeld atom refinement, which is the technique I'm going to present today inside uh, uh, OLEX2, um, can model based on a quantum mechanical wave function calculation, the delocalized density that we can uh, chemically already expect in, in uh, benzene. Uh, it can model this very nicely and we can observe that the um, bond character here is not interrupted uh, between the two atoms. And also if you have a closer look at the hydrogen atoms, we uh, do observe quite a difference in the way that they are represented. And if we go a little more into details, we can also think about what is, is the biggest effect. If we look at the spherical form factors, which are um, tabulated in the international tables of crystallography, you can see that, um, for example, if we look at carbon and a fluorine atom, the biggest difference in terms of the atomic form factor is observed in the low resolution region. And this um, low resolution region um, can also distinguish between, for example, fluorine and fluoride, where you would uh, uh, introduce an additional electron, while this uh, difference vanishes or becomes really small uh, if you go to very high resolution in despacing. Um, if you use a non-spherical atom, like the Hirschfeld atom, um, you can calculate this form factor. In this case, it's an example I will show later. It's an epoxide molecule for the hydrogen atom. And as you can see, the hydrogen atom in epoxide is 
uh, bound to the carbon atom and therefore has a slightly positive charge, um, which reduces um, the, 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 let's say, um, behavior at low resolution to lower form factor values, while at high resolution we observe that we have some uh, reflections which have a higher contribution of our hydrogen atom, while some lie below as expected from the positive charge. This is due to the fact that these which lie above um, correspond to a direction in which the hydrogen atom is deformed. It became aspherical, non-spherical, and um, ultimately this is the description of the electron of the hydrogen atom being in interaction with the carbon atom. So if we look at the carbon atom on the other side, uh, we can see that the carbon atom did obtain a bit of, of um, electrons from the two bonded hydrogen atoms and therefore generally lies above the shape of the spherical atoms, but also some uh, reflections are lower compared to our reference of a spherical um, atom. And therefore, this also shows that um, not only hydrogen atoms, but all atoms can benefit from description uh, using non-spherical uh, atomic form factors. Um, if I now go and uh, show you OLEX2 as I am uh, downloaded the release version yesterday. So uh, it's the version as it is out there for all uh, people to use. Um, you can see that if I just open a normal model here, this is the epoxide molecule. If you want to uh, open it yourself, you can find the example in the old Hirschfeld Admiral Refinement tool. Um, there's two examples, epoxide and alanine. And if you work with this example using the IAM, the independent atom model, that is the normal refinement, OLEX2 refine. I could also use Shell X, but I don't even have it installed anymore. Um, if you use OLEX to refine, this is your normal refinement. This is all fine. But um, as you can see, there's a Q peak down here. And um, if you think about it for this molecule, where would we expect um, the bond density to be localized? And this triangular arrangement usually shows this kind of banana bond, uh, which is below the two carbon atoms. So therefore, we would expect um, some density to be between these two atoms, but not on the direct connection between the two atoms, but below it. So if you had a closer look, what I just did, because I already played with OLEX today, um, there is this Nosferatu um, a tick box, which will enable the functionality of Nosferatu for your refinement. This will only work if you use um, OLEX to refine. This will not work if you use, um, excuse me, uh, this will not work if you use Shell X. So you need to use OLEX to refine. And if you enable it, you will be presented with a new GUI. And this new GUI consists of several steps. Um, the most important thing is whether you want to update your table, because the way that we introduce our um, non-spherical form factors is through a, fable, uh, through a table containing the tabulated uh, uh, form factors of the atoms for each HKL. So this is a rather complicated numerical file, which usually you are not too interested in if you simply want to refine, but you need to calculate this one. And um, the Hirschfeld atom refinement is based on a quantum mechanical wave function calculation. So uh, you will need to either select Tonto, which is shipped on board with OLEX2, but is generally uh, a bit problematic as it is slow and uh, might contain some errors for heavier elements, uh, but was kept because we also had uh, Tonto implemented in the Hirschfeld atom refinement terminal toolbox, which was the old hard tool. Um, we kept it for purpose of being compatible but um, usually I can recommend using ORCA, which is uh, free for academic use. And uh, if you don't have access to ORCA, you can also try PySCF, which is an open source uh, wave function calculation tool, 
Um, if you have it on your computer, you might also use Gaussian, um, but it's not as well maintained as the interface to Orca because I don't have a license for Gaussian. Um, if you selected Orca, you can go to the refinement uh, tab and customize your calculation. You can select from predefined uh, methods and basis sets, but this is not so important at the moment. I will simply uh, start a calculation with some settings, which I will explain in more detail later. But now you can see that we started the quantum mechanical calculation on this computer. Um, now we have a wave function and the next window that appeared was uh, the calculation of the atomic form factors. And now you can see that uh, we refined this using the new atomic form factors. And we saw that from the initial model, which was our independent atom model, which had an R1 value of 3%, we already made it down to 2.4%. So just by using this better description of the shape of our atoms, we already decreased R1 by 0.6%. But this is not where we have to stop. So as you can see, usually what you observe with um, non-spherical atoms is that your weighting scheme will reduce a lot because now we have a better description of our diffraction pattern and therefore we can uh, um, describe everything better. We need less weighting scheme to uh, obtain a good model. Um, now I clicked refine again and again and as you noted the update table became unticked. So I still use the tabulated scattering factors that I calculated but you have to keep in mind, I did the calculation on the geometry as it came from the independent atom model. And the independent atom model, as you know, and as most people um, have basically digested as uh, the truth, we usually in the independent atom model have two short hydrogen distances. But using the trick that we can now describe also the non-spherical behavior of our hydrogen atom, we do observe that we uh, can refine. So this hydrogen atom is free. If I look at the details, there is no affix, there's nothing. This is a freely refined hydrogen atom. Uh, it has a reasonable distance, um, which is somewhat close to what we expect from, from Newton refraction studies that were performed. But um, coming back to the point, we calculated our density and our form of the atom based on the uh, old geometry. So what we have to do is we might need to update this table to correspond to our current geometry. You can use this as long as you like, but uh, usually the model improves if we do the calculation once more. So now I'm calculating a new wave function. Um, which for this small molecule obviously doesn't take too long. Then the partitioning software starts, which in this case is too fast to even display any results. Um, we will see some results later and uh, refine now. If you think about it, because the atomic shape and the wave function is defined by the geometry that you use, um, we do not introduce any additional parameters to our refinement. This is um, one of the, the, the crucial things about Hirschfeld atom refinement. It's not a charge density fitting method. It's an advanced structural refinement. That means while having the same amount of parameters, we do get a better structure and a better fit to our experimental data. This way, um, you can also observe that if I remove Nosferatu and go back to the independent atom model, the hydrogens will shrink in, but we do not observe any change in the um, uh, reflections to parameter ratio. If I do, however, use the more advanced options, um, you can see that we provided switches to remove affixes and also make hydrogen atoms unisotropic for you. So you don't need to manually click them and make them unisotropic. If this tick box is clicked, which it is by default, 
um, you will refine the hydrogen atom anisotropically. And I can show you that for this example, um, which doesn't take too long, I can do it again. Uh, if you do this, you will observe that we get nice ADPs for the hydrogen atoms uh, already at this relatively low basis set. So those of you who are familiar with quantum mechanical calculation will realize this was a single zeta valence basis set. But as you can imagine, if you get more and more sophisticated, now we are at 2.1% R value. If we choose a more sophisticated basis set, for example, a triple zeta uh, basis set, we can start the calculation again. Um, now it will take slightly longer because we have a few more basis functions in our calculation. And um, now also the partitioning took a tiny little bit longer because we need to evaluate more basis functions. But in the end, this will lead to an increased accuracy in our model. So you, you can see we reduced our 1 to 1.99%, uh, which is fairly good. So if we go into more details of uh, what we can do here is you can also define a charge for your wave function calculation. As you know, uh, you need to tell the program how many electrons it needs to distribute. And this might, depending on what you uh, calculate, vary uh, uh, from zero. And we can uh, talk about the multiplicity. And this is something that I want to stress. This is not the multiplicity of a crystal position or a special position or anything. This is the multiplicity as it is defined in quantum mechanics. That is the, um, the amount of spin in the system multiplied by two plus one. Uh, if you remember back to the quantum mechanics course uh, I had, for example, to take in university, uh, this is the 2s plus one rule. So if the multiplicity is one, what it tells us is there is only one possible spin state of uh, this system. If you have unpaired electrons in your system, which is very likely in the case of transition metal complexes, you will need to define the multiplicity in order for your wave function to correspond to the uh, real um, situation that you would expect. So keep in mind that um, you do uh, in uh, you do need to think about this if you want to refine transition metal complexes. For organic molecules, unless you deal with radicals, uh, you usually do not need to vary this too much. Um, the other thing is the integration accuracy. If you want to um, have the very, very, very best model possible, you can increase this. There is four predefined settings. Low if you want to do a very fast calculation and only see if it works, basically. Normal, which is sufficient for most cases. High, which is for the um, sophisticated uh, uh, model and max uh, being basically the absolute limit that is numerically possible in all softwares, which I um, wouldn't recommend to use on a, on a production way, because this will most likely, um, this will most likely uh, keep your computer busy way too long. Another thing you can see is um, we have relativistics. Um, so for the wave function calculation, you can think about a relativistic uh, um, Hamiltonian to also model the influence of very heavy elements. You will, however, need, if you use relativistics, you will need to select a basis set that also corresponds to the relativistic uh, contraction, because otherwise your system might become unstable. The basis sets that are shipped with OLEC that can be used for this uh, are the Jorge DZP and TZP, TZP DKH. There's also the uncontracted version um, and the X2C, so exact two component uh, basis sets. Um, if you use, for example, X2C, usually what will happen is relativistics is ticked automatically. If it is not, please make sure that you check this um, because it will uh, otherwise be an unstable wave function calculation. 
So if we want to, for example, do relativistic calculation of this molecule, we tick relativistics, choose an X2C basis set, and can start the calculation as well. It will uh, take slightly longer, but for this small molecule, the effect is barely uh, witnessable. Another thing that you can do is the iterative procedure. So as I mentioned, if you update your geometry, um, you can um, run away from the, the positions that were used in the beginning of the calculation. So your table does not correspond to the geometry at hand anymore. So in classical Hirschfeld atom refinement, as it was implemented in Tonto, um, this iterative procedure would stop as soon as over a whole cycle of updating your table, your um, wave function calculation does not affect the geometry more than one thousandth, so uh, 0 0.001 of a standard uncertainty in any of the parameters of your, of your geometry, so ADPs or positions. This you can watch by this table, which is only printed if you use Nosferatu. It's a different table compared to the one that you see up here, which is the same one as it is in the um, independent atom model in OLEX2 refine. But uh, this one uh, calculates the shift over uncertainty for the whole um, procedure of calculating a wave function and uh, uh, refining the geometry. So if you click iterative, he will automatically start to calculate a wave function, do the partitioning, do refinement, calculate a new wave function, do the partitioning, do the refinement, and so on and so on. The good thing about this is if you usually click on refine, he will make a new wave function from scratch. But if you click this iterative button, he will use the wave function from the previous step. As you saw now, the wave function calculation was much faster. And uh, ultimately, the last few steps of your uh, calculation will have very low um, change in the wave function anymore, and therefore um, be much faster. As you can see now in the second step, we already observed that we have this very low um, uh, shift over parameter, shift over uncertainty, and therefore we can uh, say that this is now as it would be defined in the in the in the original definition of Hirschfeld atom refinement. A second thing which is uh, still rather new is the use of solvation models. So if you think about it, we are now doing a calculation of this molecule in the gas phase, but in a crystal. Um, you usually have neighbors to the molecule, as I show here by growing the crystal. Um, either one thing we can do is we can um, include a whole lot of molecules that surround our um, central molecule to explicitly calculate the wave function for all of them. But as you can imagine, the more atoms we have, the more time we need to um, invest into the wave function calculation. Um, so if I calculated this, is, it would take much longer than the calculation of the small fragment. This is why we can use solvation models of uh, a few selected um, solvents to already polarize our wave function without the cost of additional atoms. So using the solvation model barely affects the um, the, the time of the wave function calculation, uh, but gives better results uh, uh, in most cases. Um, especially if you have polarizable bonds, uh, you can uh, witness the improvement of your, of your um, fit in the end. In this case, we gained another 0.05% in R1. Um, I forgot to remove the iterative procedure. This is something you will learn rather quickly that it's important to check whether you have this one ticked or not because it might cost you a few hours if you have a very big molecule. Um, so I will stop this here. But the solvation model is basically a first polarization 
uh, possible for, for your molecule. So the next uh, um, example I want to show you is alanin, uh, which is also found under the tools examples uh, for heart, because um, in alanin, we can now start to think, so this is how it would usually look like. It will ask you to select which wave function uh, generator to use. I will select orca because I like it a lot. Um, I will select a basis set of my choice. I will um, put this in vacuum, so no solvation model, uh, quickly run the calculation once, and um, then I want to show you what is the effect if we grow the molecule. So now we have the wave function. We observe the partitioning software. We see a few details now, but too little to give me time to talk about it. So I will do it later on a bigger molecule. And now we have uh, refined alanine from 2.3% to 1.3%. Uh, this is quite nice. I will update the waiting scheme once more. And um, then we are in a settled model. And now I want to grow the structure. So what I do is I go to toolbox work, select growing, and uh, click on, for example, short, which will show me all the short contacts. And uh, then I can quickly select which uh, direction I want to grow. I hit escape to stop growing and now I remember visually that this one is our asymmetric unit molecule and these three are generated um, around it. So if I now click update table, what will happen is the calculation will have much more atoms. 51, uh, 52 atoms, he starts counting at zero. 52 atoms is much more than one alanine molecule. Um, so this calculation takes longer because we have many more um, exam many more atoms in this case. But ultimately, what it will do it is it will um, describe the hydrogen bond that this uh, nitrogen bound hydrogen forms with the neighboring molecule in a much better way. And this will also improve the ADPs of our nitrogen atom. Um, so hopefully this will start converging soon. And uh, then we can see the result. If you, um, if you now click into the OLEX window, this is something that you will notice. Um, Olex will wait for this process to finish. So here it says in German, keine Rückmeldung, so the window is not responding. Um, so you cannot rotate the model because we need to wait for the wave function and the partitioning to finish in order to um, work with our model again. So now you can see we have 52 atoms in the wave function, but only 13 of them are the asymmetric unit and were included in the uh, calculation of form factors. And now you can see this amine function uh, behaves much more nicely compared to the previous calculation. Now that I have the table, I do not need the cluster anymore. Now I can refine without the neighbors being present. I can do it again, um, but uh, this is, now done and I can work with it. If you look at the second tab here, which is the properties of our non spherical refinement model, you can plot various things. Um, there is tools to calculate various uh, different descriptors, but the first thing I want to show you is that we can look at residual density maps, which are basically featureless now. Uh, this is far away from, from being any feature of a bond left in the molecule or something. We will also look at other molecules in a few minutes uh, where we see before in the IAM that there is residual density in the bonds and that we can model this um, later. The deformation plot here is an interesting plot. 
it is the difference between our spherical model and our non-spherical model. So everything we see in green is basically what we introduce by using our non-spherical atom uh, uh, description. And if you play with the ISO value here, you can see um, that what we include is chemically actually meaningful. We see areas around here that is, um, for example, lone pairs of this carboxylic acid. We have the bond between carbon and uh, oxygen, the bond between the two carbons. And we can also see that some bonds are more pronounced than other bonds because of electronegativity and shifting of the bond. So um, this plot of the deformation tells you what is the difference between the, the uh, classical model and our non-spherical model. You can also see, for example, we have the conjugated uh, uh, system here with the two oxygen atoms, which depletes the electron density from above and below carbon. So these are the features um, that uh, you can look for if you want to validate that your calculation was correct. And these are the features um, that uh, usually also tell you that it is a good quality model if you can make chemical sense out of them. If you want to calculate more features of your map, I will switch over to a different example, which is uh, Zucrose. Zucrose is also shipped in the home tab where you have the example structures of uh, OLEX2, which are already shipped. I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with them. And I pre-calculated a table now because what I want to show you is the calculation of these maps. For example, the Laplacian, the electron localizability indicator, the non-covalent interaction indicator. Um, this is deformation. This is the electrostatic potential. As I wrote here, the electrostatic potential is slow because if you want to evaluate the electrostatic potential, you need to integrate over all basis functions with all other basis functions. This is a rather complicated uh, calculation. So be careful if you start it without thinking. Um, this might take a while. Another thing that you can plot is molecular orbitals. So I will click here to calculate all MOs for sucrose now. Um, and then you can select a radius because we need to tell um, Nosferatu how far away from this atom, any atom of our molecule should we still calculate the properties and in what resolution. That is the spacing between two data points. For uh, demonstration speed, I will now increase this resolution. Usually 0 0.1 is quite nice and doable. So if you now click calculate, he will start calculating all the molecular orbitals that you have in the wave function, um, depending on the, the um, number of atoms, you can have quite a lot of them, but um, this should be done uh, fairly soon. And then he will start also the calculation of the other properties. Um, like in a cooking show, I already prepared something. So um, we can already look at this. The property calculation does not inhibit you from working with the model anymore. He will do this on the side. You don't need to worry about it. Um, so if you then, uh, look at this properties window and open the drop down you will see um, what calcula uh, calculations and fields were already calculated so the electron localizability indicator is a cool feature where you can um, look at where electrons are basically undisturbed so um, where they are localized, it's, it's somehow a, a bit related to the ELF, but not on this arbitrary scale. Um, so you can see that these properties uh, correspond to chemical features like the lone pairs. If we increase the ISO, decrease the ISO value, we see that also the bonds follow this, but this is based purely on the wave function. 
So you have to keep in mind that um, these do not take into account thermal motion. They are based on the wave function, while the residual density plot is, of course, the one where we have also taken into account the ADPs or the deformation in this case also takes into account the ADPs. So you have to distinguish uh, between these properties, which are calculated from the wave function and deformation and residual density, which are calculated from the crystallographic model, that is the FCF file. If you want to plot the MOs, you can also do that. In this case, um, he will use the selection of um, the um, of the, the scroll bar that you have here. So I will, for example, use uh, 21 uh, to, to plot the MO. Then I click MO again. He will load the molecular orbital that was calculated. So you can also visualize uh, the molecular orbitals. In this case, it's a bit boring. So I might go to 35. This, this part I didn't practice, sorry. Um, so you can see that the molecular orbitals are calculated in a delocalized way. And uh, this is basically the same thing you would see also in a quantum mechanical software calculator. Um, so another example that I prepared is um, THPP. THPP is also one of the um, examples that is shipped in the home tab. And uh, THPP has a particular feature um, of Nosferatu, which I want to show you, that is uh, unique to Nosferatu. You cannot do this type of uh, Hirschfeld atom refinement with any software uh, except Nosferatu. That is, we can handle disorder. And in this case, we can show the residual density map. It's relatively easy to spot. These two atoms are basically also present over here to some degree. So what we need to do is we need to make a disorder model. And this is very easy in OLEX2 in my opinion. So first, because usually hydrogens are more difficult to deal with, I delete the hydrogens here. And these two atoms I want to split. So what I will do is I will use M split here. And then a copy of these atoms is uh, generated on the screen that you can manipulate now. So if I click somewhere where there's nothing, I can still rotate my molecule. But if I click here, I can now modify the copy of these uh, atoms. So if I play with shift and drag them somewhere around, I can place them where I want. If I just touch them here, I can rotate them. And um, this basically allows me to fit the disordered component in here. If I'm satisfied with my uh, new disorder component, I can click escape on my keyboard to exit this mode. So now we have the new model uh, prepared already, but not refined. Because what I want to also do is I want to already give them hydrogen atoms. So I select in tools, hydrogen atoms, this one, because I'm uh, pretty confident that these are methylene groups. And then I give them hydrogen atoms. You can see everything at this moment is still with affixes um, because let's first start with that. We first do an independent atom model refinement to let the model settle a bit. Then we make these ones anisotropic because everything that you do already in the independent atom model, you don't have to get settled uh, once you start the Hirschfeld atom refinement. And what you can see is the remaining Q peaks um, of our residual density map as well are located in bonding regions. Sorry, this was maybe a bit extreme. So uh, as you can see, this is what you uh, observe for a high quality um, measurement. In this case, the resolution is 0 0.7. It was molybdenum data. And uh, I would say if you, if you have a good enough crystal and a 
good enough uh, setup of the diffractometer, it is really very possible to measure this kind of, of data sets uh, on, on your home diffractometer. And now if I go to work and I want to refine this using Nosferatu, I need to think about it a bit before because now I have one component which has an occupancy of 0 0.86 and one component which has an occupancy of 0 0.138. This is 0 0.14 times an electron. So 0 0.14 electrons. If we think about the scattering power of an atom which contains only 0 0.14 electrons, this might as well, thinking about the peaks we have in our data set at the moment, get lost. So what we need to do is we should keep those atoms with restraints in our disorder component or constraints, while we can some of them refine freely. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the auto features, which would make my hydrogen atoms anisotropic and uh, remove any affixes. And I will manually select um, this component is the major component. So I will now uh, select all the hydrogen atoms. I can do that by clicking or I type cell dollar H down here on the terminal, which will select me all hydrogen atoms. I will type anisotropic anis minus H because usually anis would just make the non-hydrogen atoms anisotropic which is very fine for uh, independent atom water refinements but we are using Hirschfeld atom refinement we can refine these freely and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select all hydrogens again and I will also do affix zero which will remove the affixes from these atoms as well so Doing that, I uh, can go back to showing all of this and uh, I will start my calculation using ORCA, uh, my favorite functional, and uh, start the refinement. Now what will happen is because we have basically described two models of the molecule, we will need to perform two wave function calculations to describe the shape of the atoms in both situations. And this will then require uh, two times the amount of computational effort. In the end, both will be independently calculated as TSC files, but merged uh, into one big file for the refinement. I went ahead and calculated a few of the TSC files for people who maybe don't have um, the computational power to, to perform quantum mechanical calculations on their laptops or um, who don't have access to the software. I calculated TSC files, which I um, handed over to the Rigaku crew um, that um, I heard that they put them on the forum. I hope you can find them there and download them. If you just copy paste the corresponding TSC file into your folder um, where you do the refinement, you can select it uh, from the drop down. And this is what I'm going to show you now. Here is THPP total TSC. But as I told you, the two different parts were calculated individually. So in this folder, if I go to this folder, um, you can see we have a part one TSC, a part two TSC, and a total TSC. So from this drop down, I can select which TSC file I want to use for the refinement. If I just copy one in, I might need to update the GUI by closing and opening it again. And then you can also use one that was not calculated by you directly, but it was uh, um, handed to you already. And um, I just saw uh, Fraser updated you in the chat with a link to download the TSC files. So um, go ahead if you want to use them, feel free. All these are example structures of Olex2 that you can uh, use to, to, to practice. 
thinking about what I did to the major component, I released the affixes of, of these hydrogen atoms. But this might not work on these 0 0.14 uh, uh, electrons of these hydrogen atoms of the minor component, which is now only 12% even. So what I can do is, this is a feature I find very helpful when dealing with disorder and, and using Nosferatu. I can select these hydrogen atoms, edit them, and then after the affix command, I can put a distance I want these atoms to ride on. So if I know, for example, I've done this calculation before, I have to admit that the distance of these atoms is usually around 0 0.1.1 uh, angstrom, I can uh, uh, simply edit this affix command to reflect this. And if I now click refine, these hydrogen atoms will also be put to the distance that I input. So I can do a custom affix for hydrogen atoms to, uh, uh, to refine them, even if they are constrained or restrained. So in this case, um, you can, for example, refine also disordered molecules using a quantum mechanical calculation and um, the onboard tools for Hirschfeld atom refinement in OLEX2. You will see, however, that if you go to a higher level of theory, you um, will always obtain better results. So the level of theory that you choose and the basis set and method might influence your um, result, which is the reason why you always need to docu document this. If you use um, a certain basis set method combina combination, um, you should report this in your, in your publication when you want to publish the data, as well as in the SIF. In the SIF, it's done automatically. So um, if I did the refinement of any of these compounds, I will uh, go here and look, for example, at the alanine that I refined before. Um, you can see in the SIF um, that we included a reference to our paper where we um, published Nosferatu. So uh, I invite you all to also read this paper, which was accepted in chemical science. And um, what we also have down further down in refined special details, we have a summary of the software, the partitioning, the integration accuracy method, basis set, charge multiplicity. So the features that you use during your refinement will also go into the SIF. And this is uh, kind of crucial for reproducibility, as you can imagine, that you have this information in your SIF. Um, I will wait for this to finish, but um, I talked about the multiplicity of, of your wave function. And I want to um, go further and uh, show you in an example that is also shipped with uh, OLEX2, how you can use the multiplicity um, accordingly and how you would go about uh, thinking what is the right multi multiplicity for your model. So for this, in a transition metal complex, you have to remember the crystal field theory. If you think about the d orbitals, the 5d orbitals, usually you um, have the metal either coordinated in an octahedral or tetrahedral or quadratic planar geometry. And this will affect the relative um, positioning of the d orbitals energetically, and therefore also if you have, for example, an octahedral crystal system, you will have three d orbitals with lower energy, if I'm not mistaken, and two with higher energy. And therefore, you will um, have to fill the lower three. Think about it. If you have more than three electrons, you will um, have to fill them and count how many unpaired electrons there are to do the refinement. So in this case, if I go to the CO110 example that is also shipped with OLEX2, I can refine it here. And um, usually, if you have a transition metal, 
you have to think also about how fast you want your wave function calculation to converge because these keywords here that I didn't talk about yet are um, also crucial steps to the wave function calculation. The SCF convergence threshold is at which energy change and at which orbital coefficient change you want to consider your uh, wave function converged. If you do a sloppy SCF, this I didn't invent this keyword, this is from the ORCA manual. If you do a sloppy SCF, uh, your wave function might not be the best one, but it will be fast. If you do an extreme SCF, it's basically the same as putting integration accuracy to max. This will most likely keep your computer busy for a very long time. But sometimes the results get better if you have a better wave function calculation. The same holds for the SCF strategy. While for organic molecules or small molecules that you work with uh, without transition metals, normal conf or even sometimes easy conf uh, works. That is the dampening of your wave function, how fast it should converge in terms of, of energy minimizations. Um, for transition metals, it is always recommended to use slow conf. Otherwise, your energy will start oscillating about the minimum. <clears throat> sorry, about the minimum of your uh, uh, current geometry and um, not give a useful result. So for this transition metal complex, we have a cobalt in the middle. Um, I thought about it beforehand. It's a tetrahedral coordination of the cobalt. And I expect this complex to have a multiplicity of four, which coincides with three unpaired electrons. And if I now do the calculation, um, Orca will use this unpaired electron. It will automatically switch to the unrestricted wave function calculation, which uh, differentiates between alpha and beta electrons and uh, therefore um, perform the correct wave function calculation for this very compound. As you see, now the damping is 0.85. In the normal conf, it's 0.7. In the uh, easy conf, it's 0.6. So we only include 15% of our new optimized wave function in the next step, which will ensure that we converge into the right minimum. OK, I let this run for a few more seconds, but um, ultimately, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, keep in mind that this is rather new and we might still run into, into some trouble. If you have any problems or any questions during uh, the use of Nosferatu, feel free to uh, email me. Um, I have an email address at, um, that is florian at olexus.org. Um, you can directly reach me there and I will uh, try to get back to you as fast as I can. As uh, Joe Ferreira already mentioned, um, I have a defense on Monday. So this weekend I will most likely not get back to you right away. But uh, after that, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer your uh, questions, your problems and address things that you might encounter when you use Nosferatu. Do you want to take some questions now, Florian? Uh, yes, sure. Let me drink a sip. Uh, sure. OK, so. So we have one question that um, Horst would like to answer. And then uh, since the refinement moves to consider the asphericity of the electron density, have you considered introducing refinement of anharmonicity in the, an in the atomic displacements? So what you will um, need to consider if you want to refine unharmonicity is that you will need excellent, brilliant, high quality, high resolution data to do so. Um, if, you, um, if you refine unharmonicity on a, let's say, standard resolution data set, you will most likely 
um, swallow up unmodeled effects of, uh, for example, absorption or, or other properties that are not modeled so far. So therefore, I would be careful um, to refine unharmonicity right away. You need a very good uh, physical basic uh, and a very good high resolution data set in order to do this. So I misunderstood the uh, comment. Uh, so what about the CH bond lengths? Is it not necessary to constrain the bond length to known neutron distances? This is a very good question. Um, as I showed you in the, in the THPP molecule, sometimes it is necessary to, to restrain them um, to some known distances. In this case, I simply chose 1.1 because it is close to what I refine here freely. But um, if you look in the literature and for example, the science advances paper of Simon Grabowski, my PhD supervisor, and uh, in collaboration with um, also Magdalena Wojinska and Krzysztof Wozniak, um, you can find the validation of X-ray wave function refinement. It's a paper um, where they checked the distances of hydrogen atoms compared to neutron diffraction results. And what you observe is that you can, in good quality data sets, usually obtain in a free refinement without restraints and constraints, the same accuracy and precision as a neutron data from X-ray diffraction data for hydrogens. Because we now model the, the, the bonding of the hydrogen. So this old assumption that you cannot see hydrogen because you would get them at the wrong position is not true because we do model them that the density is at the wrong, let's say, position, that it is in the bond. And therefore, um, you can freely refine hydrogens unless they go crazy. If you have problems in your data set, you can, as I showed you, use the um, restraints and constraints to keep things sane. Thank you. Um, would you need to know high spin versus low spin for, say, a D4 transition metal? High spin multiplicity would be five versus low spin, which would be a multiplicity of three? Um, you will need to think about this. So um, if you input the wrong multiplicity, it might also be the case that the wave function becomes very unstable. Um, which you will observe in the calculation window of, um, of, of uh, ORCA, for example. I will go back to this uh, example. If I now calculate it with the wrong multiplicity, what will happen is that the energy will never really settle. This is not a guarantee that you have the um, correct multiplicity, but usually if you have the correct multiplicity, uh, you will also obtain uh, a converged function comparably quick. Okay. Um, another very clear and interesting presentation. Thank you, Florian. Regarding a model like this epoxide test case, is there any consideration that after the Nosferatu refinement, it would make sense to somehow damp or restrain the anisotropic parameters of the four hydrogen atoms to be similar? Um, there's, there's two philosophies that you, you might have on this take. So one philosophy is um, that you trust your data that you measured in order to um, con that it contains the correct information. But um, there is also um, the possibility. So you can use Zimu, you can use ESOR, for example. I didn't show it now, but um, there is ESOR, there is uh, um, or RIGU, for example. If you have a hydrogen atom that is very flat or even non-positive definite, as you can see in this case, you can go there and refine this using a regal restraint. Maybe I will do this now quickly. Um, I will go back. If you ever bought anything and don't have the files anymore, uh, you can go to Olex2, Nosferatu history, 
and you will have a backup of, of any of the calculations that you did. So you never lose the result if you update anything. Um, you can always go back. So in this case, I will refine it again. And as you can see, these two hydrogens are non-positive definite. So we can go here, type Rigu, and it should take care of the hydrogen being non-positive definite, which is rather unphysical and uh, force it to behave more nice. So this you can introduce step by step until your model is uh, more sound. Okay. Um, besides salvation models, is the tradition is the tradition for Tonto option of surrounding the central molecule with a cluster of charges and dipoles during the wave function calculations also available? So it must be is the option for Tonto of surrounding. Yeah, uh, I, I see the question is from Magda Wojinska, who is uh, one of the authors of this validation of his fate <laughs> at the refinement method. Um, so thank you for this question. Um, in Tonto, there was the possibility to also generate um, charges which would correspond to the crystal symmetry and model the crystal environment uh, of the calculation, which we have not successfully implemented so far for ORCA or PI-SCF. But if you go to Tonto, there is the cluster radius. So in this case, you can input the uh, radius until you want to, to uh, grow the cluster and calculate the wave function using Tonto. However, in Tonto you have a very limited choice of methods and uh, Tonto is relatively slow. So um, uh, in the future we want to implement this also for the other techniques, uh, ORCA, pi SCF, Gaussian. Thank you. In what case will you use a charge not equal to zero? Can we do such refinement only for some part of the structure? For example, only an anion, uh, but refine a large cation the usual way? Okay, this is a good question. So I loaded the example structure, Timmy. Uh, Timmy is also provided uh, for use in the zip file that I uploaded. And uh, in this case, when you uh, think about it, this, uh, I think it's a calcium ion in the middle, is surrounded by more molecules. So if I would calculate the wave function only on the asymmetric unit, which is neutral in charge, um, this would not be the correct model because the calcium would lack interaction partners on some side. So what you have to do is you have to grow the cluster uh, to, to fully have the coordination sphere for the calcium. But then you think, okay, this calcium is the asymmetric unit one. So this one is going to be used in my uh, refinement, while the information on these two calcium atoms is maybe not as interesting to me. So I can delete them from my cluster that I grew and uh, simply use the calcium of the asymmetric unit. But if I want to calculate this wave function of what I see on the screen, um, maybe let me put it this way. The philosophy is you, uh, what you see is what you get. So what you see on screen is what the wave function will be calculated for. In this case, we have one, two, three, four doubly negative charged uh, carboxylic acids and one positively charged, double positively charged uh, calcium so the charge in total will be minus six. And um, this is just something that happens if you have, for example, ionic uh, systems, if you have, um, let's say, some, some partial growth, um, which you will need to do, then you might run into a situation where you need to define the charge. Thank you. Um, along these lines, are there any guidelines on which solvation model to use? For example, would you select a very polar solvent when we're finding an ionic structure? Very good question. Um, so my take on this is that um, you can uh, use any solvation model as long as you document it in your publication. 
and you can play with it as much as you like because also the assumption of a wave function, the born Oppenheimer approximation, all of these approximations are made. So your solvation model is also one approximation you make. And um, there is no guideline what to use. What makes sense, for example, in this case is that I see there's, hydro, uh, there's water. So if I, for example, have a situation where I squeezed a water molecule, I can use a solvation water model to introduce the polarization on the wave function that this water molecule would have again. So you can play with this if you, for example, have toluene in your crystal structure, you can use the solvation model for toluene as it is implemented here. You can go and select toluene, THF, whatever you like, and, and polarize your wave function with it. Thank you. Uh, I believe you answered this, but um, let, let's review this question. Please explain the calculation of the wave function and disordered structure, and also how to group the different parts. Okay, this is a, a, a tricky thing. If we go to this disorder molecule again, if you have more than one position where you have disorder, you might run into the situation where um, you have more than one uh, position which is disordered. So if I also disorder this part, um, I would have part one, part two, part three, and part four in the worst case. And then I will need to tell Nosferatu what belongs together in order to make a complete wave function out of it. So there, if you click the info button here next to Nosferatu refinement, the group parts for disordered structure has a rather lengthy explanation of an example, how you would uh, introduce this uh, if you, for example, have um, ion exchange in a crystal structure. Um, this is a, a rather advanced question. And if you run into problems, I'm happy to also personally assist uh, later through emails. Thank you. All right, our next question is, how would you determine the correct multiplicity to use if you have a structure in a mixed spin state? Ooh, this is a tricky one. Ideally, you would have to grow, uh, you would have to, make a, um, a disorder model where you have the same molecule, but um, then assign a different multiplicity, which is so far not possible in Nosferatu yet. So a mixed spin state would be one of the limits of Nosferatu at the moment. But since I also saw that we might need multiple charges and multiplicities, this is a feature I want to implement in the future. Thank you. Um, would it is it possible to use the RI approximations as implemented at ORCA to speed up the calculations, especially in larger systems? Very, very clever thinking. Um, I have to admit, I also thought about this, which is why if you look at the ORCA output file, for example, you already see that we are using RI approximations in ORCA, which makes it a whole lot faster compared to other wave function generators. Okay, thanks for the nice talk. What about the check SIF results obtained from SIF refined via this method? Does it show any special alerts in the case of anisotropic hydrogen refinement and so on? Very good question. Um, the anisotropic hydrogens are not a problem for uh, check SIF, but check SIF does not know about the TSC file at the moment. So since uh, Chexif will calculate f calcs on its own, it does not trust you with your f calcs. It calculates them using the independent atom model. What might happen is that you get an A or B alert, which says residual density is wrong, R1 is wrong, everything is wrong. But the only reply to this is we are using a non-spherical refinement. And at some point, we hope to find a common base with Chexif and the IOCR to um, have a standardized SIF for these cases where you can uh, do this. So far, I, as a, a publishing uh, student, would always respond to this um, saying, this is a non-spherical refinement. Uh, please treat this uh, this way. Thank you. 
Would a good measurement with copper be good enough for these methods? This is also a very, very important point. This is, um, uh, let me go back to the slides. If you look at this, I included the um, usual um, diffraction limit of kappa here. So the deviation from the spherical model for hydrogens, for example, is observed way below kappa diffraction limit already. So if you have a good quality kappa data set, you can very well use your Schwedt atom refinement. Okay, thank you. So this is a rather lengthy uh, question. Um, I'm aware of the data requirements for refinement of higher order motion, but in the context of data that's good enough to begin modeling aspherosity, you often see features owe to anharmonicity. This in turn affects structural parameters and screws apparent static electros, electron density, say even at 150K and with data at 0.5 angstroms. Or does Nosferatu truly not consider FOBs in generation of F calc aspherical? The um, scattering factors are completely independent of your ADPs. So whether you use unharmonicity or not, whether you use isotropic or anisotropic um, displacement parameters does not affect the um, generation of the TC file. However, the F calcs are generated using these ones. So if you use unharmonicity, um, you would or you could improve the, the model. But this feature is still very, very experimental. And therefore, I uh, would recommend you get in closer contact with the OLEX people um, to discuss uh, in further detail. Thank you. Um, did you refine some data containing hydrides using those for us too? The U of the hydrides might be twice larger than a normal hydrogen. Okay. Um, hydrides will um, easily be spotted in the, in the TSC file, for example, or in the Nosferatu log, because you will have a negative charge of them. And this will, if you refine them using the independent atom model, you will refine them with an atom that has only one electron. While if you um, refine them with Nosferatu, you will have the correct number of electrons. So it will also, um, it will refine this in the way, assuming that it has the correct number of electrons and therefore your U iso or your U uniso should also become more reasonable because it doesn't need to describe two electrons with one electron. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Can we post your email in the chat window? Sure, go okay. ahead. All right. We'll take care of that momentarily. Um, how can I carry out a topological analysis of the modeled electron density based on the refined wave function? Yes. Um, just a semantic uh, detail, the wave function is not refined. It's simply the atoms re refined using the wave function. But um, if you go to the folder, you have WFN or WFX files um, of the calculation. So you basically free of charge already get a wave function that you can analyze and uh, um, refine, uh, use for, for example, the topological analysis of QTAME uh, later on. These are according to the standards of, of uh, the softwares, so you can go ahead and use them as you would if you calculated a wave function on the, on the geometry uh, in the gas phase. Okay. Um, can it handle disorder with part minus one? Hmm. To be honest, I haven't tested it so far. Okay. Um, Horst, do you want to answer that if you know the answer? I don't know the answer either. We have not tested that. It, I okay. can't see any reason why it shouldn't work, but as always with these things, it, you know, it may not work. We need to test that. Good point. Indeed. So if we have a metal complex with counter ion, 
in the gas phase by computational software, we could remove the counter ion and go ahead for the with the calculation. But in this case, the molecular structure, both cation and ion are present. So we have to calculate them together, correct? That is correct. You will have to calculate both of them. Um, if we go ahead and implement the feature um, to, um, sorry, um, if we implement the feature to have two uh, separate entities with two uh, different charges and multiplicities, you might in the future be able to calculate your anion independently with a positive, uh, with a negative charge and your negative, uh, your positive cation with another charge independently of each other, for example, in a solvation model, and then merge them by using the, the disorder function. So you define your cation as part one, your anion as part two, and then ultimately you obtain the complete um, uh, uh, TSC file to use later on. Keep in mind, however, that if you separate these two entities, um, you will introduce a bias because you do not allow you do not allow um, charge transfer between the two entities anymore. So it will be a different uh, uh, different model than if you calculate them both at the same time. Thank you. Uh, great presentation and beautifully implemented feature. If I understood correctly, the form factors can be fixed in the final refinement, but they are optimized based on the initial model. Is there a risk of over refining them on low quality data? Um, if you have too low quality data, you will basically not observe much of an improvement if you use the non-spherical atoms because your data simply doesn't contain the information. As soon as you start seeing residual density on the bonds, you will for sure observe an, an, an uh, improvement in R1 statistics. The peaks will go down. Um, so there is basically not much harm in using it. The only thing that you might waste is computational time. Okay. Uh, I think you answered this one uh, essentially a couple questions ago, but let's review this. Can one use this method on just part of the structure? Okay. If you want to use it only on a part of the structure, you will have to obtain the remaining bits from somewhere else. So if you want to treat a part using the IAM and the rest using Nosferatu, you would need to obtain tabulated scattering factors for the, for the missing atoms from somewhere. This is not implemented automatically. You would need to provide this table by yourself. Um, in general, I would rather go the way of separating entities if you want them to be treated on, on different level of theory or something, if you have a solvent, which you don't care too much about. But usually uh, if you model everything because Fourier transformation is a tricky thing. You do something over there and it also affects your atoms over there. So um, it's generally a good idea to have your whole model consistent. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Florian. This was a, a extremely enlightening lecture. I really enjoyed it. And Thank um, you very much. I just want to uh, say good luck on Monday. Um, Thank you. Defense and uh, your career in, in crystallography and quantum, quantum crystallography, we'll call it. Goodbye. Thank you for having me.